for our study tonight, I'd like to take into consideration an idea uh, that we're going to utilize our board here tonight, and I'm going to show you ahead of time what we're going to be trying to do. If y'all remember back in the beginning when God created man, he placed God, a man in the Garden of Paradise, and as, uh, as the Bible allows us to understand, God and man were in harmony. Everything was fine. God was happy with Adam and Eve, and they were living in a wonderful place. God gave Adam and Eve a law, as you remember. He said you could eat anything you want to in this garden except for this one particular tree. And the day that you eat of that tree, thou shalt surely die. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I think if I'd have been living in paradise, and as far as I understand, they could have lived there forever, I believe I'd have paid attention to God. But you know, Adam and Eve didn't. They broke the only law which God gave them. As a result of that, man is cast out of the good graces of God. He is now sinful in the sight of God. Here's what we're going to see this evening, and we're going to see it in a way uh, that we'll have it all up here when we get finished. We'd like to see how man, or once again, might be right in the sight of God. That's what we're going to be working toward. We want to see how that you and I can be right in the sight of God and can enjoy the benefits of being in good graces of, with God again. Now, in order, as I said, to see it, here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to separate God and man, and uh, we'll just do it like this. I'll get over here on this side of the board, and I'm going to write the word God right here. And then I'm going to get off out here, and I like to call this the guilty distance caused by sin, and I'm going to write the word man. You see, man and God are separated. Man and God have to get together. Man has to, has to find some way to make things right in the sight of God. So we have to begin our story like this. Since man is a transgressor, he's the one that broke God's law, you know what has to happen? God has to take the first step in our salvation. It would have been impossible for mankind to reach over and get himself by his own bootstraps and pick himself out of the mires of sin. We can't do that. So we have to expect God to do the first step in our our salvation. I'm very happy to tell you God is willing to do that. In John the third chapter verse 16 the Bible says for to God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed that him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because God loved this world and we're not talking about this ball of clay that I'm standing on and you're sitting on. I'm talking about humanity. He so loved humanity that he gave his only begotten son so that you and I might have the opportunity to be saved. Now last night if you were with us and uh, I want to redefine this idea. I believe it was the night before. It wasn't last night. Uh, we talked about the fact that because of the grace of God, man has the opportunity for salvation. Because of God's grace, Jesus Christ is sent into this old world uh, to die upon the cross so that man might be saved. And I find that this is, the, uh, uh, this is the first step as far as man's salvation is concerned. Jesus is sent into this world so that he can bring about whatever is necessary for the salvation of mankind. Uh, we're going to find out how all this happens. But let me tell you right up front again, it happens because of the grace of God. Uh, the grace of God that we defined the other night and I'm going to redefine it for the benefit of those of you who are not here. You know, I said for years, I define grace as the free and unmerited love of God. I did not deserve it. I did not earn it. In no way could I cause God to do it. But he poured out his love upon me or his grace. The definition I like today is this one. Grace is giving us what we need rather than what we deserve. As sinners in the sight of God, we deserve to die and be punished everlastingly. That's not what we needed. We needed to have an opportunity to be saved. God gave us the opportunity to be saved through Jesus Christ. So Jesus came into this old world and uh, he begins to set into order those things necessary for the salvation of mankind. Let me tell you a little bit about Jesus. You know, Jesus wasn't born on this earth like you might expect the Son of God to be born. Why, he wasn't even born like the king's son or the governor's son or any important person's son. We find Jesus is born in a stable because from the very onset, man has no room for Jesus in his home. That hasn't changed. To this very hour, the most of this world has no room for Jesus in their life. Jesus started from this humble beginning 
out there in a stable with the rest of uh, those animals that were out there. But do you know what? From that lowly beginning, there's one that's going to rise that shake this old earth to its very core. Jesus Christ is going to accomplish more in a few short years than anybody that ever has before or since. Uh, from this start, which you might think is an insignificant start, which it most assuredly is, is going to rise the Savior of the world. Quite amazing to think about. And uh, I'd like to review for you just a few things about the Lord. First of all, we don't know much about Jesus in his early life. We have a little insight when he's about 12 years old. And then later on, the Bible says Jesus is 30 years of age and he has to be up and about his father's work. Uh, the, the thing that I'd like to emphasize right here, when Jesus came into this world, he said in Matthew 28 verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And that's special right there, and I want to remember that. I want to write it right here uh, under the, the word Christ. Jesus said he had all power. Uh, the word power simply means authority. When Jesus came into this old world, God gave him the authority or the power to do whatever's necessary for the salvation of man. Well, Jesus did other things. He began to select his apostles. He chose 12 men out of all the men of this world. And uh, he gave them the opportunity, to, as far as I'm concerned, to hold the greatest office a human being could hold. They're going to be the ones who carry on the business of Jesus to establish his kingdom here upon this earth. The 12 apostles um, were selected uh, for a very special purpose, and they carried that purpose out. I find Jesus made his apostles certain promises. Uh, let's write them in here because they certainly play a big part as far as man's salvation is concerned. He uh, chooses his apostles. And we find out that just as um, surely as he made the selection and he told them what was going to happen, we find it's going to happen. But you know what? Jesus tells his apostles he's going to send them the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. What sort I've said unto you? Now Jesus says, I'm going to send unto you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Uh, this Holy Spirit will teach you everything that you need to know. Well, things went along. And I want to tell you all something, and this amazes me every time I think about it. You know, the apostles of Jesus really didn't have a clue what his mission was. They thought Jesus was going to set up a literal throne uh, in the city of Jerusalem and establish himself as the king of the world, and they might get to be princes or governors or something like that. They were expecting an earthly kingdom uh, right up to the time that Jesus died upon the cross. But that's not the case, as you understand. Uh, there's going to be something else besides an earthly kingdom. Jesus also said, some of y'all are going to be ashamed of me. Some of y'all are going to deny me. And of course, they said they never would do that, especially the apostle Peter. But you know, the time came. There's a mob beginning to boil and clamor for the blood of Jesus down in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus has gone out of the garden of Gethsemane and took the three men that he loved better than anybody else here upon this earth. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. Uh, he asked these three disciples, watch for me while I go a stone so further and pray to my father. He goes out there and throws himself down on the ground and prays the most agonizing prayer you can read about in any type of literature. The Bible says Jesus prays. What's he praying? Father, my Father, I know you can do it. Let this cup pass for me. Jesus didn't want to die. He's asking his Father if he can avoid this. You daddies in the audience, can you think about that? Your son's pleading with you to let this pass from you. That can't be, we all understand. And Jesus quickly closes his prayer, not my will, but thine be done. And we find Jesus comes back out and finds the three men that he loves, as I said, better than anybody, sitting out there asleep. Now, folks, I want to tell you all something about that. I believe the crown of thorns pressed down upon the brow of Jesus heard him. I don't think there's any doubt about it. The slapping and the cuffing he took at the hands of the Romans, I believe that hurt him. I believe those nails nailed in his hands hurt him. But I seriously doubt if anything hurt our Lord anymore than to come out of praying and sweating blood and finding the three men he love better than anybody else sitting out there asleep. It's amazing, isn't it? The mob finally works up their nerve and they come and get the Lord. They take him away like some common criminal. 
put him through a mockery of a court, nothing but a kangaroo court, pronounce the death sentence upon him, and take him out and nail him to the cross. And do y'all know what happened? Jesus died. He died apparently like any other man. But let me assure you, this is not any other man we're talking about here. This is the Son of God. In three days and three nights, Jesus Christ is resurrected victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And again, he makes his appearance before his apostles. You know what they think? Now then, we're going to get to have this kingdom. Now then, he's going to establish his throne. Such is not the case. Jesus is with his apostles for a few days, and then he tells them in Luke 24, verse 49, tell it again the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The apostles go on into the city, and they're waiting just like he told them to. Now, I hope you've been staying with me. God, because of his grace, sent Jesus. Jesus came with the power, authority to do what was necessary. He has now died upon the cross and promised the apostles he would send them the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit ever come to the apostles? Look up here, if you will. Now, if the Holy Spirit never did come to the apostles, our little story's over. And we're still in jeopardy. Uh, there's no way or no hope. But... I'm very happy to tell you, the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit does come to the apostles. Those of you that like to read along, and I know some of you do, we're going to the second chapter of the book of Acts now, and we're going to spend a little time there because this is where our sermon continues. Uh, we find out that the apostles go into the, the city of Jerusalem, and they're waiting. They're waiting for they don't know for what sure. Uh, they're waiting for this coming of the Holy Spirit uh, that they don't have a clue about. And then certain things begin to happen. Look at there in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, locks of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What happened? They're waiting in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Strange things begin to occur. There's a sound like a roaring wind. There's cloven tongues set upon each of them. And they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, you know what? I've heard at least three different explanations about what happened on the, in the first four verses of the book of uh, second, uh, the second chapter of the book of Acts. Somebody told me one time, everybody around there received the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. They call this the Pentecostal experience. You know, there are still people today who want to get the Pentecostal experience. Did several thousand people receive the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit in the first four verses of the book of Acts? Well, think about it. Somebody else said, no, no, no. It wasn't uh, hundreds of people there. Uh, it was just the 120 disciples in the upper room and the apostles. 120 and the apostles. And then somebody else said, no, it wasn't 120 and it wasn't a multitude. It was just the apostles. You say, um, what do we do? Well, we figure out who it is. In this case, it's really easy. Look again in Acts 2, beginning to verse 1. When the day of Pentecost is fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of a rushing mighty wind where they were there sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues, locks of fire, and it set up on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why, it's easy, isn't it? Who received this miraculous gift? They did, or them. You say that doesn't mean a thing to me. Well, do you remember your eighth grade English? These words are pronouns. You know, for a pronoun to have any value, it must have an antecedent noun for which it stands. In other words, the, noun, the pronoun has to stand for a noun. Most of the time, when you're trying to find out who the pronoun stands for, you back up. That's what you do here. You don't have to go very far. Look at the last verse of the first chapter of Acts. The Bible says, the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they... Who's that? Matthias. It took the place of Judas. And the 11 apostles were all with one accord in one place. Now, friends, there's no need to make a mistake about this. There was not hundreds of people received a miraculous gift on Pentecost Day. 
There was not even 120 plus disciples received a miraculous gift. The only ones who received a miraculous gift were the apostles. They were the only one it was promised to. Jesus told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem till they be endued with power from what high. That power comes to the apostles. Did it bring them power though? Did it bring them any power? Uh, let's get this hooked up here because the Holy Spirit has come. Did it bring them power? Well, it did. As you all notice there, uh, we find the apostles begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to take a little sidebar right here. Um, anytime you read other tongues, like here in Acts chapter 2, are unknown tongues, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it is always talking about a foreign language. Always. It'd be just like tonight if I were to begin to preach to you in Russian. For me, that would be an unknown tongue, and it would be a miracle. Uh, unless you understand, it would be another tongue that you didn't understand either. It is always another language. You know, back in the early 1900s, there were some people who wanted to have the Pentecostal experience, and they wanted to speak in tongues. So they began to, uh, to speak in tongues, they said, and when they began to uh, challenge them about this, here's what they would say. Uh, they would say that they were speaking in a, some obscure language, like Swahili. We got any Swahili interpreters here tonight? How about Chen Yanzi? Anybody speak Chen Yanzi? Probably not. So you see, they're pretty safe. Who knows? Maybe he's speaking Swahili. Wasn't long till they invented um, voice recorders. And you know what they found out? They weren't speaking in another tongue or another language. They were rattling around in human uh, uh, gibberish that had no meaning whatsoever. Uh, did that shake them right down to their core? No. They just backed up and got another grasp and uh, come back and said they were speaking the tongues of angels. But you just remember when the Bible says other tongues and unknown tongues, it's foreign languages. Uh, that's one of the powers they received. You know, they received other powers. They could raise the dead. They could heal the sick. They could handle serpents. They could drink poison. And they did so. They did all those things. You know what that was for? Uh, that was to confirm their testimony. Here's the way that it works. Uh, let's say the apostles go into a strange city. Nobody knows them. They're strangers. Uh, they come in. They preach the gospel of Christ. Nobody knows that either. That's a strange doctrine. What are we going to do about that? These people have no credits whatsoever with us. Uh, we don't know them. We don't know what they're talking about. And then they'd walk over here and open a blind man's eyes. Somebody that everybody knew had been blind all of his life. What do you think now? Look here. These guys have opened the blind man's eyes. They've made the crippled man to walk. You know, only God can do that. These fellows must be from God. Their doctrine must be from God. They confirm their testimony with signs. These folks nowadays who claim to work miracles have got it reversed. Now then they work one of their so-called miracles, and then they call for a testimony to confirm their miracle. Just the opposite of what it was intended for. The signs were to confirm the testimony of the apostles. And they used this power in the first century to be able to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you got what the power is over us? You see what the power is for us? Well, let me see if I can help you with it. Uh, they could do these miraculous things, but look, right there in Acts chapter 2. It seems the Apostle Peter, who is sort of the spokesman for the apostles, uh, he stands up and he begins to preach. Uh, he says right there in Acts 2, and we'll start at verse um, 22. Peter says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that it should be holden of it. You see what the power is. You still don't see what the power is. Well, let me try again. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 18. Paul says, For the preaching of the cross is unto them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You got it now, don't you? If you don't, I'm going to give it to you. 
Romans 1 verse 16. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What most important power did they receive for us in that day and time? They received the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what they got, the word of God. When Peter stood up there and told these Jews how Jesus died and was buried and rose again, he preached to them the gospel. When he laid it on them like this, you know what y'all have done? You crucified the Lord of glory. And all you preachers and all you preacher wannabes never, ever, ever forget that. He didn't mealy mouth around these Jews, same ones that crucified Jesus. Uh, he didn't whitewash this truth. Uh, he didn't alter it or make it easier to take. He laid it on them. Did that do anything for them? It most assuredly did. Look what happens. I'm going on down a little bit further. And we're going to find out that uh, they've now heard the gospel for the very first, very first time. Man has heard the gospel. Uh, is anybody listening? Well, let's see if anybody's listening. Look on down there at verse um, 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I wish I could find people like that today. These people are cut in their heart. And they say to Peter, what can we do? That's wonderful, isn't it? They recognize what they've done and they want to know what to do about it. When Peter closed this first gospel sermon, he closed it there in verse 36 and he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. They're pricked in their heart. What can we do? What do y'all reckon Peter told them? Did Peter tell them, put your hand on a radio? Put your hand on a television? Send for a prayer card? Send for a prayer cloth? Sign the funny book. Uh, go into the tent and pick out the denomination best fits your preconceived ideas. What did he tell them? He didn't tell them any of those things. Look at there at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall see the gift of the Holy Ghost. I hope he didn't tell them that. You see what he said? Repent and be baptized every one of the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's an old fogey, isn't it? That's the oldest old fogey there is. That's the original. That's the first gospel sermon and that's the first Christian invitation. What do you do? You repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. That's still the gospel today in spite of the fact that not everybody knows it. What happens? You know the gospel's still preached today. Um, I never see anything happens like this today, at least not in the United States that I've ever heard or anywhere else today. Look what happens. I'm going on down at verse 38, or verse 41, excuse me. Then they that glad received his word were baptized. And the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. What happens? When they heard the gospel, they're baptized. How many of them were baptized? 3,000. I'd just love to write to OPA some month and say, I preached the gospel last week, offered the gospel invitation, had 3,000 responses. Of course, I know that's never going to happen in my lifetime. But that's what happened on Pentecost Day. 3,000 stepped out and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what do we got? We've come quite a long way. If you've been staying, God, because of his grace, sent Jesus. Jesus died upon the cross uh, with the power to do what was necessary. He sent the Holy Spirit to bring power to the apostles. And the apostles have now preached that power, the gospel to man. Thank God man's heard the word again. Something's come our way. And what has happened? Some 3,000 have obeyed it. Now, I don't know if I've told y'all or not, my wife, Darlene, she makes fun of me about some things. You know, I'm liable to be sitting around reading a dictionary. 
she makes fun of me for reading the dictionary. But I want to tell you, you can learn a lot reading the dictionary. I was reading a dictionary one day, and I found out what this is right here. You know what a group of people are who are bound by a common creed? That's the gospel. Who have obeyed a common ordinance? Baptism. You know what that is in the dictionary? That's an institution. We have now got an institution. Uh, it is a group of people, 3,000 strong, common ordinance, common creed. Now, what kind of an institution is this? Now, I could tell y'all we'd be done, but I would rather read it to you. Let's see if we can find out what they're doing. Look on down to verse 42. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. What is this group of people doing? They're continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, preaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and prayer. Do you know of any group of people who continue steadfastly in that? I do too. But I'm not going to tell you. Look a little bit further and let's see what else we might be able to find out about them. I'm going on down to verse 47. The Bible says, praising God and having faith with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. My friend, there's the church. This is the first time in the history of mankind that the church is spoken of as being in existence. Other places, Jesus promised the church, Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. He said, I say also to the entire Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Here it is, though. These people are the church. Now, you know what I wish? I wish I could just quit now and just say, is there anybody here that would like to be a member of the church? You know, I got thinking about that. Suppose you'd have been back there and you were one of those baptized. Let's just say you were baptized by the Apostle Peter. Peter baptizes you and brings you up and you wipe the water out of your face and you say, Peter, what church am I a member of? You know, the likelihood is Peter sows you back under the water and holds you till you got more uh, clarity. That wasn't even a question back then, was it? But it is today. Uh, you know, there's, um, I, I can't keep count. There's over a thousand different denominations plus, all claiming to be the church you read about in the Bible. So we have to take a little more time and try to find out who or what church this is. Now, whatever or whosoever this is, it won't be hard for us to find because it's up here on the board. Everything it took to bring into existence, we've already looked at it. So let's go back and let's start again. I'm going to ask the question, is this the church of God? That's in the Bible, you know. The Bible says in Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Is this the church of God? Now, I should have explained this to start with. When I wrote the word God up here, I mean Jehovah, God the Father. You know, there's really nobody named God. God is a name for a divine individual. We have God the Father. That's who this indicates. We have God the Son, Jesus Christ. We have God the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking the question, is this church we just uncovered, the church of God, meaning the Father? No, it's not says the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Uh, God the Father did not die to purchase the church. So it's not the church of God the Father. So let's go again. I'm going to skip this. In. Is this the Holy Spirit church? Nope, not the Holy Spirit church. The Holy Spirit brought the, God, the power to the apostles. Is this the apostles church? Not the apostles church. The apostles preach the gospel to man. Is this man's church? No, it's not man's church. When man obeyed the gospel, the Lord added him to the church. What church is this? Well, who had the power to establish it? Who had the authority to bring into existence? I find the church was established as a result of the promise of Jesus. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. Very possessively. Uh, Jesus said he's going to build his church. Furthermore, I find the church is referred to in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, giving him power of all things, uh, all things to the body, which is his church. 
This church is the body of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, it's referred to as the bride of Christ. I find again, this is the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. We just read a minute ago. Now I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to be real careful about it. The Bible tells me in Romans 16, verse 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. I declare this is the church of Christ. He built it. He bought it. He established it. What else can it be? But we need to do a little more checking. And we can maybe come a little bit closer. Now then, I want to find out just exactly what we know about this. Uh, what about this church we've just discovered? You know, there are certain things which allow us to understand this. In Matthew the 16th chapter, verse 18 and 19, that I quoted a minute ago, Jesus said, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In the next breath, he tells Peter, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatso thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatso thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, listen, folks. The word church and the word kingdom are used interchangeably there. Now, there is some distinction between the word church and kingdom. Right quick, because this is not our study tonight, I'll show you how I look at these two things. Look at here. You see this little circle right here? That represents heaven. You see this bigger circle down here? That represents the earth. Now, the Lord's kingdom is all of heaven plus God's people on the earth. That's the kingdom. Who are God's people on the earth? Well, the word church means the called out or the sanctified. These are the church. So you could say the kingdom includes the church or the church is part of the, of the kingdom. When Jesus established his kingdom on earth, he established his church. So when, when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. He's talking about the same thing. All right, let's go a little bit further. I'm going to Mark chapter 9, and I'm going to read verse 1. Now, everybody here, you need to know this verse. It'll serve you well. Listen. He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now what did he say? It'd be just like tonight if I told y'all, some of y'all seated here, seated here tonight, you will not die till you see the kingdom of God come with power. What would you know? You would know within your lifetime, you'd see the kingdom of God come. Now, the next time somebody comes up and the Lord's kingdom was established in 1915 or 1914 thereabouts, or somebody may tell you even the Lord's kingdom hadn't come yet. Here's what you know. If the Lord's kingdom hasn't come yet, there's some of the disciples of the Lord around here somewhere that'll make Methuselah look like a schoolboy. Because he told them within their lifetime, they would see the kingdom established. And I assure you, it happened that way. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ was established in the lifetime of the apostles. But now there's another point I want to draw out of that. He says the kingdom shall come with power. Let's write that down. What is this going to happen? The Lord's kingdom or the Lord's church is going to come with power. All right, let's go again. Going to Luke 24, verse 49. He said, Tear it again in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Now, where's the power going to come? The power is going to come in Jerusalem. Now, everybody look here. When the power is going to come in Jerusalem, when the power comes, the kingdom or the Lord's church will be established. So the Lord's church is going to be established in the city of Jerusalem. I'm writing that down up there because that's really important. All right, let's try it again. This time I'm going to Acts 1 at verse 8. But you shall see power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When are you going to receive this power? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Let's reason again. The power is going to come when the Holy Ghost comes. When the power comes, the kingdom of the church will be established. If I know when the Holy Ghost comes, I'll know when the Lord's kingdom will be established. Well, I know, and so do you. 
Look at that Acts 2 again, beginning verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. What, what day is this? This is Pentecost day. He goes on to say, there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind, fill all the house where they were sitting, there appeared of them cloven tongues, likes of fire, and it set up on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When was that? Pentecost day. That's when the Holy Spirit came. What happened when the Holy Ghost came? Brought power. What happened when the power came? The kingdom or the church was established. You say, fine and dandy. But I don't know anything about Pentecost. Well, you can. Pentecost is an Old Testament feast day. You know, the Jews had two feast days. The first and the most important was Passover. And the next one, most important, was Pentecost. Now, here's the way it worked. Passover fell upon the certain day of the month, about the 15th day of the Jewish month of Abib, which corresponds almost to April, by the way, sort of halfway between April. Uh, and um, the 15th day of the month, you know, can come on any day of the week. So the Passover, let's say the Passover comes on Wednesday this year. When's Pentecost? Well, you move to the next Sabbath, which is Saturday, and you count 50 days. That's what penna means. What's 50 days plus the past Saturday? Well, 49 days would be seven weeks and put it back on Saturday. Plus one more day. What's the day after Saturday? Sunday. Or the Lord's Day. The first day of the week. The Lord's Church was established in the city of Jerusalem on Sunday. The first day of the week, Pentecost. You say, what else you know? It's like I've been telling you almost every night. If you can't tell it, I love this story. Because it's all just like that. I know what hour of the morning it was. Do you know that? Some of the people around there, you know this will always happen. Some of the people around there that see this great occurrence... This Pentecost day, they think the apostles are drunk. And Peter stands up and he tells them, they're not drunk. Look at him, Acts 2 verse 15. These are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. And you know what's going on? That bunch of Jews out there, there's some of them wagging their heads. It's a devil looking up and he's trying to distract what's going on. And it says these men are drunk. Peter says, they're not drunk. It's just the third hour of the day. The Jews kept time much like we do. They call their, their daytime hours hours. They call their nighttime hours watches. Uh, the day can, it started about 6 o'clock in the morning. What's the third hour past 6? Six? 6, 7, 8, it's 9 o'clock when all this is going on. 9 o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk, Peter says. It's just the third hour. The third hour was also a Jewish day of prayer. And also historically, men aren't usually drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he presents all that. What time is it? Nine o'clock, Peter said. What else do you know? I know what year it was. Now I do know there's a discussion about the calendar and all such as that. But here's the way you can look at this. Jesus was 30 years of age when he began his personal ministry. It is generally agreed this is about three years later. Uh, I am satisfied with the idea that this happened in A.D. 33. Now while I'm here, I want to answer a question. I, I would imagine everybody here knows, but in case you don't, I'm asked this more often than I like it. People come around, they say, why did they wait 33 years after Jesus died to establish a church? They assume that A.D. means after death. B.C., you know, means before Christ, and A.D. means after death. That's not what it means, so. A.D. is an abbreviation for a Latin term. The Latin term is, term is Agno Domini. Agno Domini means the year of our Lord. This is the 33rd year of our Lord. Now, what do we know? We know the church you read about in the Bible was established in the city of Jerusalem uh, in A.D. 33 on the Lord's Day about 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, you might ask yourself, why is that important? 
Friends, that's terribly important. Let me just give you a few ideas as to why this is important. Uh, this allows me to understand that any institution which is older than 33 AD is too old to be the Lord's church. It also allows me to know that any church which is younger than 33 AD is too young to be the Lord's church. It tells me that any institution, for instance, that was established in 606 in Rome, Italy is not the Lord's house. Any institution established in 1607 in London, England, 1874, somewhere in Pennsylvania, 1907 in Chicago, 1865 in London, 1859 in Midway, Kentucky, 1729 in London, 1914 at Hot Springs, Arkansas, and 1898 in Anderson, South Carolina is not the Lord's church. The Lord's church was established in AD 33 in the city of Jerusalem. See how important that is. Do you know that everything I put up here on the board is not only something that you can follow along with, it was all prophesied of. Every bit of it was prophesied. For instance, the city, 800 years before Christ was born, the old prophet Isaiah made this prediction. He says uh, in Isaiah 2, beginning verse 2, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord shall flow forth from Jerusalem. We got the right city. Look again. Do you know we have got the right preacher? Did you know Peter had to be the, be the preacher? Jesus said to him in Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, I say also unto thee, thou Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and I'll give unto you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You know what the keys to the kingdom of heaven are? The gospel. Peter got to use the keys to the kingdom first. Being a preacher myself, I can't even imagine this. Peter, you're going to get the keys to the kingdom, the good Lord said. A few days later, he's using the kingdom to let the Jews into the kingdom. The keys to let the Jews in the kingdom. A few years later, he's called up to the house of Cardius, a Gentile. Who do you think's up there preaching first? Peter. He uses the keys to let the Gentile world into Christianity. It's wonderful, isn't it? What a deal for any preacher. The keys of the kingdom, first to Jews and first to Gentiles. We got the right preacher. You know, Peter didn't get to pick his own sermon. No, I know. He, uh, he had a sermon he had to preach. Matthew 24, or Luke 24, verse 47. Listen now, I'm going to get this on my hands. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Did he get to that? Let's see. Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. Who's there? Nations from all every place under the sun. Where are they? The city of Jerusalem. He got the right sermon, didn't he? We got the right city. We got the right preacher. We got the right message. We got the right church. The one you can read about in the Bible. I almost hate to do what I'm about to do. I'm going to give you the 30-second version. Y'all may prefer the 30-second version. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to give you our lesson in 30 seconds. And if you ever want to review this, you'll know how to do it. I'm going to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading at verse 16. It's talking about Jesus. And that he, Jesus, might reconcile both Jews and Gentiles unto God in one body having slain the enmity thereby remove the hatred from between them and came and preached peace to you which were far off the Gentiles and then there were nigh the Jews for through him Jesus we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple, unto the Lord. There it is. That's the story. 
And I'm ready to draw our lesson to a close. Would you like to be a member of the church you can read about in the Bible? Well, we're about to offer you that opportunity. I wouldn't ask you to do anything that these people didn't do back on Pentecost Day over 2,000 years ago. Wouldn't ask you to do anything they didn't do. You said, well, it doesn't say anything about believing. No, and you have to believe. Hebrews 11 to verse 6, he says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them to seek him. And let me tell you something. We know they believed. They were pricked in their heart. They're cut to the quick. With the understanding, they've crucified Jesus. He didn't have to tell them to believe. They believed. He said, repent. That's what these Jews need to do. Repent. Change your life. He, you say they didn't confess Jesus. I assure you they did because confession is a prerequisite to baptism. We find the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, a man riding along in a chariot. And uh, a preacher appears to him, and I'd like to enlarge on this story because I really like the story. Uh, the preacher begins to preach Jesus to him, and the minute they come to a water, and the man says, here's water, what can we be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He made that confession. They stopped the chariot, they went down both of the water, both Philip and Eunuch, and he baptized him. That's the way that it works. You're baptized. Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, for the remission of sins. Baptism is for the remission of sins. If you never have obeyed the gospel, why don't you do so? And you know what will happen? Let me tell you what we won't do first. If you come forward tonight and tell me that you'd like to obey the gospel, uh, we will not do this. We won't call on the brethren in this church to see whether or not we want to take you. We won't do that, not for a minute. We won't ask for a show of hands or a vote whether we would like to accept you in uh, this congregation. We won't do that either. Let me tell you what we will do. Just as quickly as we can make arrangements, we'll assist you in baptism. We do it quickly because you're not saved until you're baptized. You know, people tell me all the time they're baptized for the mission of sins. They, ne they weren't, but they think they are. Here's your test. If you think you were saved before you were baptized, you weren't baptized for the mission of sins. If they waited to baptize you till the next day or the next week or the end of the month, uh, you weren't baptized for the mission of sins. The timeline for baptism in the book of Acts is straightway, the same hour of the night, because they realized the person was not saved until he was baptized. We'll do that same thing. As soon as we can make arrangements, we'll assist you in baptism. And then you know what will happen? Praising God and having faith with all the people. And the Lord will add you to his church. That's the way it works.